deck the halls with... Oh, okay. You probably don't want to hear me sing, do you? I've got the deep bass, phlegm voice that I've had for a week. How many of y'all had like this weird Christmas cold over the last week or so? All right, it's not COVID, just in case you're wondering, all right? It's just cold. But uh, it seems like it seems to be hanging around with a lot of people this year. But um, anyway, it is what it is. We're glad you're here this morning. Glad you're here for the first week of our Christmas series entitled Deck the Halls. We are counting down to Christmas. You can already see where we're moving some of our countdown, 25, 24, 23. It's getting closer and closer and closer and closer. So here's my question. I did it in first service, and there were three victims. So we're going to find out in second service. How many of you have not put up your Christmas decorations yet this year? Put your hands up really, really high. Put your hands up high. All right, you are dismissed. You can leave this service and go and get it done today, all right? Jesus will not enter your heart until your Christmas. No, I'm teasing, all right? I'm, I'm just messing. It's, it's true, all right? So anyway, it is Christmas season, and we're ready to start this series. But I want to share something with you before we start this series. Um, this morning, uh, we have my friend uh, Keisha, who is here with us, and one of her team members, Ashley, that is with her. Right back here in the back of the auditorium, there's a table that is set up, and it is advertising, letting you know about a conference that we are going to be hosting here at Living Water in January. Now, those of you that just raised your hands and said, I don't have my Christmas decorations up, you're not thinking about January yet, all right? But we all have calendars, we're all planning. Um, Over the last few weeks, I've shared with you guys, those of you that have been around me a lot know that I can't help but talk about it. Um, A month or so ago, I went to something called an emotional recovery clinic. Um, I did not know that I needed emotional recovery, but I found out very quickly, I am very messed up. How many of y'all knew that before I went? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, But um, I'm just telling you, God worked in my life. We have actually had 19 people from our church who have gone through emotional recovery clinics, so that's kind of cool. But Miss Keisha and her team are going to come in January, and we are going to host the first ever, um, um, it's going to be called Relationship Recovery Conference that's going to be here. So when you hear relationship, everybody thinks, oh, this must be for just husbands and wives. It is not. How many of you have a relationship that is broken or struggling in your life? Raise your hand. I want to see. How many of you have a relationship that is broken or struggling? Okay. How many of you have people at work that you do not like? Raise your hand really high. If you invited them this morning, don't raise your hand. All right. But but yeah, raise your hand really high. How many of you have people at work that don't like you? Okay. There we go. All right. There are broken relationships everywhere. And what we want to do with this conference is help you realize that in your relationships and the way that it deals with your own heart, that we all have pain. We all have hurt. We all have traumas in our life. And this can be a way that you can be given the tools and the resources to help you begin that recovery process in the relationships of your life. Also, if you're married, we'll be covering some things on those topics as well. But for the most part, this is relationship recovery is what it's going to be. It's January the 12th and 13th. You'll see more information about it that we'll release through our website. We'll make more announcements about it. But uh, Keisha and Ashley have joined us this morning. There's a table back there in the back. And if you want more information, when we end this time together, you can go back there and talk to them. You can also sign up for the conference. The conference is going to be $150. You're thinking, man, that's a lot. I got to buy Christmas presents. We'll get somebody to buy you this conference for Christmas. That'll be even better than all the junk you're going to throw away by the middle of January that'll be broken. All right. So get somebody to do this. Come be a part of it. Um, if you sign up uh, today or before Christmas, uh, they're given an early bird special of 125 instead of 150. Um, it's well, well worth it. Um, you're going to love this. But anyway, sign up for it. You'll be a part of it. Cool? Good? Cool and good. Everybody say cool and good. We got you covered. All right. So you do that. Let me jump into our series this morning because we are anticipating Christmas. If you walked in this morning and you didn't join us last Sunday, you noticed that Christmas threw up all over our building. Have y'all seen that? We love Christmas. Miss Crystal, our children's director, she usually leads us off and everybody on staff gets excited about Christmas. And then they drag me into it and I get excited about Christmas and we put up lights and we put gifts and out front this year, we made this big, huge gingerbread advent calendar that's out there. Did y'all see it? Did y'all see it when you came in? If you didn't get it when you came in, um, every Sunday in this series is Advent. The word Advent, by the way, means coming or the expectation of someone coming or anticipation. So every week out there at the Advent calendar, the big, huge gingerbread house, we're going to have a gift for you every single week or something you can do with your family. This week, we have a Christmas ornament. And if you didn't get one, when you leave today, get one. And they're one per family. So if you walk up there and say, I need five, 
May the fleas of a thousand camels infest your armpits. They are one per family, okay? If we have some left next week and you want more, we'll talk to you about it then, all right? But one per family today, and you get those. But this idea of Advent, this idea of this expectation, this anticipation of Christmas. How many of y'all remember when you were kids and you just couldn't wait for Christmas to get around? Boy, I remember it. I remember as a kid just waiting for Christmas to show up, waiting to see what I was going to get, how, my, how it was going to work out, what was going to happen. It was just all these fun things, and the anticipation just built day after day after day. Everything began to just grow as we anticipated, and, and it feels like this is what we're doing this time of the year. We're anticipating Christmas. We can't wait. Some of you have the dream. My wonderful wife had the dream when she married me. I'm telling you, in her mind, yeah, it's it's kind of a nightmare sometimes now, but anyway. All right, so her idea of Christmas was she could not wait to get, we were going to go to the Christmas tree farm, and we were going to cut the perfect Christmas tree down, and when we cut it down, we'd strap it on top of the car, and we'd take it to the house, and the whole way back home, we would be singing jingle bells, and it would just be a blast, and the kids would be excited. We'd get home, we'd put the Christmas tree in the Christmas tree stand, and we'd stand it up, and we'd decorate, and music would be playing, and hot chocolate for everyone and marshmallows the size of pillows and it was just going to be the greatest Christmas in the world. But she married the Grinch. I don't dislike Christmas. I just don't like Hallmark. How many of y'all watched the Hallmark Christmas Biltmore movie already? You've already seen it. Uh, Have you already seen it? Can I tell you how it ends? The same as every other Hallmark movie that's ever been created. All right, no, it's the same. I actually watched it with my wife. I had a good time. It was great. But my wife always had these anticipations and these dreams, and we'd get through it. But as we look back now, we kind of have to laugh a little bit because we'd get the Christmas tree, and the Christmas tree stand would be broken, and we'd fill it with water and sugar, and then it would pour out all over the living room floor. And then I'd hurl the Christmas tree outside of the house and just once. But anyway, it was all these things. We have this anticipation, and we build up to it. Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but the very first Christmas, there was a lot of anticipation for that one as well. And it didn't turn out the greatest either. Because, um, I don't know if you know this, but giving birth in a barn around animals probably doesn't sound like the most sanitary thing in the world. It was probably not the most beautiful scene. I know we all have Advent pictures in our house and Mary and Joseph and the farm animals and their heads are glowing and we're all like, oh, it's Christmas. But this woman gave birth in a barn. That wasn't fun. It didn't meet the anticipation. Now, a lot of you got it all built up in your heads. Christmas is coming. You can't wait. It's going to be exciting. When in reality, what you're really going to have in your house is uh, National Lampoon's Chevy Chase Christmas Vacation. That's probably going to be what it's going to be like. Something's going to explode. Some, one of the relatives is going to show up that's going to bring up that subject that doesn't need to be talked about. Your aunt's going to show up with her jello mold that's really molded jello. You're going to have all the things that are going to happen. It's just not going to meet the expectation. But yet here we sit. Here we sit anticipating this idea of Christmas. Our stores around us, they have already, good Lord, they were putting out Christmas decorations while there were still Halloween things up. Everybody is anticipating it. The entire world anticipates Christmas. But so often, Christmas comes and we find ourselves going, is this what I was waiting for? Is this really it? See, this idea of Advent is this anticipation and waiting for the coming. And and we know, those of us that are Christians, and you may not be a Christian this morning, you're welcome to be here, and we, we enjoy having you here. We created this environment for you. But those of us that are Christians, we're waiting for a second Advent, a second coming of Christ, when everything's gonna be made right again. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul actually writes about the entire creation. In Romans chapter 8, verse 22, he says these words. He says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. The entire world is wanting to see this coming of Christ. It's almost like the anticipation of Christmas. So where did it all start? 
I, I want you to join with me this morning, and, and you can look up on the screen and read the scripture and follow along that way. You can scan the QR codes that are on the chairs in front of you on the magnets. Go to our sermon notes online and see it that way. But I'm going to use several scriptures this morning to try to help us see some things about Christmas. As a matter of fact, I want you to go back in your mind with me. So when I talk about going back, some of you are going, oh, I'm going to Bethlehem, and I'm going to the stable, and I'm going to Mary and Joseph. I want you to go back further. I want you to go back to the very first mention or idea of Christmas ever in the Bible. And you know where that's found? In the strangest of all places. It's in the beginning, in Genesis. You see, we get a picture of God in creation. Now, we don't know when God's existence began. It never did begin. It never is present and never is in the future because God's not limited by time, space, or matter. So therefore, God has always been. If you don't understand that, join the club. I don't understand it either, but God has always been. But somewhere along the way, God, who lives in perfect community, we believe in a trinity, in a God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in perfect community together. Somewhere along the way, God said, I'm going to begin creating things. Matter of fact, it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we can see it up on the screen. You can see it in your Bibles. It says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God did what? Created. God loves creation. I can imagine the scene in the cosmos of wherever the cosmos was as God saying, hey, let's create. He's got the sun. He's got the spirit with him. And God says, ooh, 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 I got an idea. Let's throw some stars. Let's put a star. Oh, that's a cool star. Let's put one over here. We'll put one over there. And God just putting stars, and then he begins to create galaxies, and galaxies are going out this way, and galaxies, galaxies we have no idea about are out that way. And then he creates our galaxy, and he names it after a candy bar. Two of y'all got that, all right? So he creates our galaxy. Y'all should go back to science class, all right? He creates our galaxy, and he creates the planets in there. And we got this one planet. We can't figure out if it's a planet, but he created it as a planet. But God created the planets, and then he said, I know what I'm going to do with the planets. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them all revolve around this big ball of gas, this big star called the sun. And then just a, a couple of planets over from the sun, I'm going to create this thing called the earth. And if I set the earth like this, it'll be too cold and too hot. So I'll turn it just a little bit like that, and then we'll make it spin like this as it rotates around everything and I can just see God and, and the Son the Father the Son and the Spirit and all of eternity just going hey let's do this let's do that let's do creation and then he tells the Spirit at the end of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 he tells the Spirit he says the Spirit was hovering over the waters how many of y'all like the water how many of you can't wait for beach season already you cannot wait to go to the beach and dip your feet in the toes you can sing every country song about toes in the water and anyway you know all the songs and you know where to go with that you cannot wait to get to the ocean you cannot wait to fish you cannot wait for the water well the spirit began to hover over the water and as it began to hover over the water i can just imagine the father saying to the spirit hey why don't we create some fish won't that be cool and, and, and the spirit, it begins to create, and he creates lobster. I, I think he only created lobster so we can eat them. But anyway, he created lobster. And then he created whales. I mean, wasn't, wasn't that incredible creativity? A bunch of huge animals floating around or swimming around in the ocean going, Mwah. isn't that crazy? Or something like that. And, and then as the spirit is hovering over the water, he says, hey, let's, let's create sharks. How many of y'all like Shark Week? It comes out every year in July. Isn't it the greatest thing in the world? Shark Week. He creates sharks. And then he, and he gets to the little coral reefs and he says, let's create clownfish. Come on, God. That's crazy, the creativity with which God is creating. And I, I don't know if I can just see the scene and y'all can't see it, but I can see the spirit hovering over here and I can see Jesus, the son, going, hey, God, Father, look at the sky. Why don't we do this? Let's create some birds. Birds will be really, really cool. Birds will be great. We'll create big old huge birds that build their nest up on cliffs. And then we'll create little bitty birds that flap their wings so fast it almost looks like they're sitting in space and it, let's, let's make them hum. We'll call them hummingbirds. That'll be great. Can you imagine the creativity of God? And all the stuff that he was creating as he had Father, Son, and Spirit coming together and everything that was being put together. But there was one creation left. God's greatest masterpiece. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we see it. You know it. And we're going to talk about Christmas right here in Genesis. In Genesis 1.26, here's God speaking. He says this. He says, then God said, 
let us, by the way, us is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is the Trinity working in perfect unison and perfect community. He said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. Now, why would God create man in his image and likeness? Well, eventually, God is going to send his son into the image of a human in which he created us out of his image. So God's already creating with this picture and this beauty in mind. He says, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock, over all the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. I can just imagine creation. I, I can picture Jesus going, hey, let's create some horses. And as the horses are starting to be created and they're going through the fields and they're running through, the spirit probably stepped up and said, hey, you want to have a little fun? Let's put some stripes on some of those horses and we'll call them zebras. And listen, God's creativity is amazing. But when he creates man, he holds on to this magical place. In verse 27, he says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Both male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now, there's some things we don't know in the book of Genesis. We don't know how long they were in the Garden of Eden. We don't have any idea. Some of you think that the sixth day God created, the seventh day he rested, man and woman were together, fruitful, multiplied, those things that were happening, and you think it was just a day or two. I don't know. Could have been a day or two. It could have been, I don't know, a couple million years. I don't have any idea how long they were in the garden, and neither do you. And if you think you have a theory, you're probably wrong. We don't have any idea how long they were in the garden. We don't completely know what it was like. We don't know what was going on or how it all worked together. But... God created mankind with something incredible. And I need you to hear me say this. God created mankind, not like little robots, but with the ability to choose to love him. You have a choice this morning. I can stand up here and I can lose my blooming mind. I can scream and sweat and spit and do everything in the world to try to convince you to give your life to Jesus. But at the end of the day, I don't get to choose for you. You get to choose. And God, when he created man and woman in his image, he put inside of us the ability to be able to choose him. And because he put that choice there, he started anticipating Christmas. Matter of fact, we're told in other passages of Scripture, I won't put them up on the screen, that before the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain. We understand that even in creation, God knew he was going to create a man. He knew he was going to give him choice. And when we're given a choice, sometimes we make the wrong decisions. Sometimes the hurts and the pains and the darkness and the difficulty of this world enter in. But God was anticipating Christmas all the way back. In creation. Let me prove it to you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Again, you're probably familiar with the story. If you grew up in church or not in church and you went to a vacation Bible school sometimes, you probably heard this stuff. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says it this way. It says, now the serpent, and remember, the serpent is a representation of the enemy, of Satan, because there's this entire cosmic war that's going on. We don't know the exact time. We don't know about this being limited by time. But somewhere, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, describes the fact that Satan came before God. He was a created angel named Lucifer, came before God and said, I want your place. I want to have the same thing you have. God cast him out of heaven for his pride and for his arrogance, and a third of the angels went with him, and that's the demon. So we have this cosmic battle going around, and this is where this enters the earth. Now the serpent, which is the devil stepping into this and, and taking on this identity of a serpent, of a snake, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And then it says this, it says, he said to the woman. Now, I, I got to take a time out right here. How many of y'all have ever read, read through the entire Bible? Y'all ever read through the entire Bible? You ever read through Genesis before? And when you get to the verse in Genesis and it says, and the snake said to the woman. How often do we just go past that? The snake said to the woman. Can, can I say that one more time? The snake said to the woman. I don't know about this freaky Garden of Eden and what was happening in there. 
In creation, did the animals talk to Adam and Eve? It doesn't say that the snake started talking to Eve and she went, oh my gosh, this talking snake. It doesn't say that. She must have been used to talking snakes or talking animals. I can't wait until the world is made perfect. I've got some animals I want to talk to. Like, I want to know why cats are just cats. I don't even know why. They think they're God. That's the problem. So they were probably cast out of heaven with the devil. But anyway, all right. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I said to somebody earlier, if all dogs go to heaven, then all... Anyway, I'll leave that alone, all right? So, so in the garden, <laughs> God had created, the devil takes the form of a serpent, and he speaks to the woman. And can I tell you something about our enemy? And you may not be aware of this. Or maybe you are and you just never heard it this way. But the enemy never comes to you and says, I want you to do something evil. I want you to cheat on your spouse. I want you to get so involved in lust and pornography that it ruins your mind and ruins your marriage. I want you to cheat your work so bad that you have to get fired one day because of how much time and effort you've stolen. I, that's not the way the enemy fights. The enemy has always fought the exact same way. Always. Jesus actually refers to the enemy in the book of John when he says the thief. He talks about the thief and he says the thief comes and he always steals and he kills and he destroys. He always works the exact same way. And this is how he works. See, when the serpent came to Eve, and by the way, I, I just want to let women off the hook here for just a second. Because in church world, we always go, well, if that woman would not have given in and eaten that piece of fruit, and some of you think it was an apple, but the Bible never says it was an apple. But so many people go, if that woman wouldn't have sinned, then all of mankind would have been bad. Here's the problem. God created man before he created woman. It was a man's responsibility to protect his wife and to be there and to keep the enemy from tempting and attacking her. So if the man would have stood up and been the man he was supposed to be, then sin wouldn't have entered into the world that was free ladies all right y'all can pay for my lunch if you want to it's all good all right <clears throat> so there's a snake talking to the woman and Adam's there he's off to the side and unfortunately he's kind of cowarding out of this and he said to the woman the same kind of way that he speaks to us he doesn't come forward and say do something evil he says this he says did God really did God really say that to you? See, that's the way the enemy attacks us. There, there's people, there's probably people sitting here this morning that you've got your own idea of sin. The idea of sin in the Bible, sin is missing the mark. So if you say, how do I identify sin? Well, God is perfection and anything short of God that we try to live for or try to live through, that is sin and we miss the mark. And the enemy will always present us with the idea, did God really mean it that way? So think about it this way. So God created this idea of sex, this idea of being fruitful and multiplying and the benefits and not just the creation of, or the procreation of sex, but also the joy and the benefit of that. So God created this and then he created this incredibly healthy boundary for this to be in within the concept and within the context of marriage and God created it that way. But the world has taken this in such a way of saying, did God really mean we have to only have that in marriage? I mean, we love each other and we're going to get... See how the enemy works? And that's just one example. I could probably give a thousand. So that's how the enemy's working with her as well. Did God really say? And then look at this. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, that's not what God said anyway. God had said you can eat from any tree except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the enemy's already lying to her and already trying to get her to think a certain way. And listen... Because of her sin and because of Adam's sin, again, Adam was there. This wasn't just an Eve and the snake thing. Adam was present in this situation. And because of that, sin entered into the world. In Romans chapter 1, verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man, that being Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all have sinned. You all are a bunch of sinners. Did you know that? Will you just help me out by saying, I am a sinner? Help me out. And if anybody said, you are a sinner, you are correct, but you didn't tell you about yourself, all right? 
Our nursery right now, this is going to be hard to believe, our nursery right now is full of little bitty sinners. They are. You may think they're perfect, but they're little bitty sinners. And that's the way you need to greet them in the morning. Good morning, my little sinner. No, don't do that, all right? But, but that's what they are. We're all created in this, and it's because, because of sin in the garden. Because of the choice that was made. And you're going, Tony, I thought we were talking about Christmas. You keep talking about sin and death and separation from God. I thought we were talking about Christmas. Oh, here it comes. See, God already had Christmas on his mind. All the way back when man chose to sin. Matter of fact, you can look ahead in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. See, in Genesis chapter 3, as man and woman chose to sin, there were curses that were given. A man was cursed to have to work the fields and and to work the ground in order to get his food. He was going to work and and deliver by the sweat of his brow. For a woman, her pain was going to be greatly increased in childbirth. There were curses that pronounced on men and on women. And then there was a curse that was given to the snake, which this is where we're going to see Christmas. Are you ready? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, so the Lord said to the serpent, to the serpent, to to the devil, to the enemy, to Satan, to Lucifer, to any other name you want to put there of him, He said to him, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And here it is. Are you ready for Christmas in the garden? Here it is. He says, and I will put enmity. That is brokenness. That is danger. That is warfare. I will put this great difficulty between you and the woman. Between your offspring. Now I want to help you with something. The word offspring in the original language is actually translated the word seed. So if you have or you've read or you grew up reading the King James Version of the Bible or other translations of the Bible, this particular verse will say, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Well, I'm going to help you just a little bit. If you took ninth grade biology, then you understand that a woman does not produce seed, does she? Does she? No. Do y'all understand that? I do not want to teach that lesson right now. Do y'all understand that? Okay, great. I just want to make sure, all right? So, the seed comes from the man. But yet God is saying this. And he's referring to the fact that he's going to have to become a man. That he's going to send his son. Because one day, there's going to be a virgin that's going to conceive and she is going to give birth to a son and we're going to call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. She says, or Jesus, God says in this, I'm going to put enmity between you, between her offspring, her offspring and you. And then he says these words. He says, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That is a prophecy of the cross. That is a prophecy of God is going to come. He's going to send his son, Jesus, himself in the flesh. He is going to become a baby. He is going to go through the womb of a woman. He is going to be born. He is going to live a perfectly sinless life as 100% God and 100% man. And I know that math doesn't make sense, but it doesn't have to make sense in God's kingdom. But God is 100% man and 100% God. And as he is here, eventually he is going to grow up. He is going to live a perfect life and he is going to give his life on a cross. And at that cross, that same enemy, that same serpent who was in the garden is going to strike at the heel of Jesus at the cross and he's going to say, aha, I got you, I'm going to kill you off. But three days later, Jesus is going to get up, he's going to look at the devil, he's going to look at Satan and he's going to go, boom, your head's out of here, buddy. That's the prophecy of Christmas in the garden. And there's a promise in that. See, When sin entered into the world, everything went crazy. Roses started growing thorns. We started having to sweat to work. I've never given birth, but I've seen it twice, and it doesn't look comfortable. And there's promise in Romans that Paul gives. He says these words. He says, for just... As through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. So here it comes. See, human history begins to unfold. Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden. 
As they're cast out of the garden, they begin to have children, and they have Cain, and they have Abel, and then the first jealousy and the first murder begins to, be, begins to come into the planet. Sin begins to build up. But I can almost picture in the garden when God is telling them that eventually the, 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 that Jesus is going to crush the serpent's head. I can almost picture Jesus living up against a, leaning up against a tree and going, I'm coming back. I'm going to come for them. There's an advent. There's an anticipation. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to be the redemption for people. And then sin begins to take place and all of this is happening and I can see God. I know I'm imagining this and you just got to imagine with me. I can see God and his son Jesus in heaven. I can see sin beginning to run rampant all over the earth to the point that God says sin is so bad that I'm going to flood the entire world and I'm going to restart with a new family. I'm going to restart with Noah and his family and we're going to restart the entire world and I can just imagine Jesus looking at his father and saying, hey dad, now? Is now the time? Is this the time? Is this when Christmas is going to happen? Is this when I'm going to go back? It's almost like a kid trying to get somewhere on vacation. Is it time yet? Are we there yet? I can just imagine Jesus saying, Dad, is it time? And God going, nope, not yet. Not yet. Well, Noah gets off the ark, and we all love the story of Noah and the ark. Nobody has in their nursery, in their, in their Noah and the ark decorations, Noah planting a vineyard, getting drunk, and standing there naked. That doesn't work really well in your Christmas nur- or in your nursery with your children. But that's part of it as well. Noah begins to sin right back again. Sin begins to be, move itself through the earth and move through things. And then God chooses a man. He chooses a man by the name of Abram who eventually becomes Abraham and he says, I want you to go to a people that you don't know and I'm going to create a promise in you. And Abraham is beginning to age and Abraham gets to up over 100 years old and he's married to this pretty woman but she's 100 years old and at 100 years old parts don't work correctly and things aren't correctly working with Abraham and they're not working with Sarah and God shows up in the flesh and he says, there's a promise that's going to come through you. And Abraham goes, what? What? And Sarah goes, are you kidding me? (laughs) Kind of funny. And I can imagine Jesus in heaven going, is it time? Father, is this the time? Now, Dad? Now? God says, no, not yet. I got more. So from that point on, we know that Abraham and Sarah gave, or Sarah gave birth to the son of the promise, which is Isaac. And then we get Father Abraham and the nation of Israel. And y'all know Father Abraham, right? Y'all remember the song from Vacation Bible School? Y'all remember it? Father Abraham had many sons. A lot of y'all grew up Baptist. This is fantastic, all right? Y'all can do the hand motions and we'll all get dizzy and throw up, all right? So that, that's where it started. God uses Abraham and the nation begins to be built. And through nations, or or through Abraham's great grandson, the nation begins to be formed. Ultimately, they go into captivity into Egypt. And God says, I need a deliverer. I need somebody to deliver my people out of Egypt. And I can just imagine Jesus going, Now? Now? Is it time, Dad? Is it now, now, Dad? Is it now the time? And God says, No, not yet. I got this guy, Moses. And of course, Jesus is probably going, Moses, he can't even talk well. What are you kidding? God says, nope, I got Moses. He's kind of going to be a foreshadowing of you because he's going to deliver people from bondage and from Egypt, which represents sin, and Moses is going to do that. So Jesus goes, all right, fine. So the nation begins to develop. The nation of Israel begins to to be free, and they take the promised land under Joshua. And then as they begin to live in a time of judges, they decide, we want a king like every other nation. And the nation of Israel chooses a king and God gives him Saul and he wasn't the right guy because Saul steps up at first and then he becomes a coward later and God puts his anointing on a guy by the name of David. And he says, I need a deliverer. And I wonder if Jesus goes, is it now? Is, it, is now the time, Dad? Is it time to go? And, and God says, no. And, and then Jesus goes, but David's out of Bethlehem and I know there's something about Bethlehem that's gonna be coming up. God says, no. But you're gonna be tied to this king His name is David. Matter of fact, your generation is going to be counted back to his. So years have passed. Years will pass in history. God's chosen people will continue to sin and continue to rebel. Oh, they'll build a temple for God. They'll build a place where God's presence will dwell with them in the holy of holies. And it'll be beautiful, but they'll sin and it'll be destroyed. Then they'll rebuild it again and they'll sin and it'll be destroyed. Oh, by the way, when we're reading the history of the Old Testament, don't forget, it's kind of a picture of your life too. Yeah, sin keeps entering. Is it time yet? Is it time yet? Here's where it's cool. This is my favorite Christmas verse in the entire Bible. 
and y'all think I'm going to go to Matthew or Luke and tell about the Christmas story, this is my favorite verse in the Bible about Christmas. The Apostle Paul writes it to the church at Galatia, and he says this in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the set time had fully come. You see, all the way back there in the garden, all the way back there in the beginning, when you were given a choice. See, you're sitting here this morning and you've got a choice. Oh, I know you're anticipating Christmas. I know you're anticipating Advent. And some of you are anticipating the return of Christ. But some of you are sitting here this morning and the choice is sitting in front of you. Are you going to choose to follow Jesus or are you not going to choose to follow Jesus? And what scares me more than anything else as a pastor is that someone in this room will leave today and say, I do not choose Jesus because I don't know when your life is going to end or when he is going to come back because there is going to be a second Advent and he is coming back and I don't know when that's going to happen see I wish I knew when life was going to end it would be a whole lot easier today's December the 3rd 2023 tomorrow is December the 4th y'all know that because it follows December the 3rd but for me for my mom sitting here on the front row for my children and my grandchildren December the 4th is a tough day because December the 4th 30 years ago My dad was on a mission trip in Africa, and he was killed in a car accident 30 years ago tomorrow. And you go, wow, 30 years ago, man, that's old, that's a long time ago. My dad was only 52 years old. That means at 26 years old, he was at midlife. I don't know when that time's going to come for you. But I do know this. God has a set time. And God has a set time for Jesus to come to this earth. And he said in Galatians, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem. Everybody say the word redeem, please. Go. Redeem. Redeem. That's what you need. Every single one of us need to be redeemed. Redeemed means somebody's taking your place. See, we know that we've all sinned. We know that every one of us is short of God's perfection. And because we have sin, we need redemption. We need someone to step into our humanity, into our place, to become fully a man, but fully God. What we need, what we need is Christmas. See, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, As Matthew is writing this about the advent, the coming of Jesus, the first time he says this, he says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? What does it mean? God with us. The enemy's head is crushed. And you've got a choice to make. Will you accept that or will you not accept that? Because he's already come. He's already made a way. In 1 John chapter 3, John, the author of this book and who was there with Jesus and was an eyewitness to everything, he makes this statement about Jesus. He says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The reason Jesus came to this earth is because the choice that was first made in the garden which was a choice that was made for all of us, and we've all sinned. And because of that, if eternity starts today for some of you in this room, and God forbid, I'm not putting anything on anybody, but we don't know when our last breath is. And if today you're breathing your last breath and you enter into eternity, and you do not accept the redemption of Jesus, you will be forever separated from him. That's a mean thing to say at Christmas time. No, it's actually a really good thing to say at Christmas time. Because there's a promise. There's a promise in the anticipation of Jesus coming. And that promise is that he's given his life for you and he's given his life for me. And it all started all the way back in the garden when sin entered. See, God didn't come up with a plan after sin started. God already had a plan in place. From before the foundation of the world, God knew what needed to happen. And now you've got a choice to make. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? So there's people watching online, you all that have filled up this auditorium for the second service. You've got a choice to make. 
are you going to do with Jesus? What, what, what are you going to do with him? If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never admitted that you're a sinner and asked God into your life to change your life and surrendered your life to him, you need to. You, you need to. Not so we can put a, a number on a board and say we got another person that got saved, but so you will not be eternally separated from God. There's a promise in this anticipation that God came. So don't miss that. We're a, we're a next step church. We have a next step desk back in the back of the auditorium back here where when we leave here in a minute, you can go talk with someone, you can pray with someone, you can find out what your next step is. Maybe for you, it's that decision to follow Jesus. In a minute, we're going to close our eyes, not right now, and I'm, I'm going to talk to you with your eyes closed for a minute, but right now we're going to keep our eyes open because there's some other next steps. If you're a Christian this morning, if you're somebody who's striving to live your life for Jesus, there's some next steps for you too. So I'm, I'm going to give them to you. They're going to put them up on the screen for me, and I'm, I'm going to help you see some next steps you can take with a message like this. Number one is this, don't miss the promise in the anticipation. As you walk out of here today, don't go back to the busy, crazy hustle world of making sure presents are bought and all the stuff's done, I mean, except for y'all that haven't put up your Christmas decorations. Get that going, all right, people? But you know what I'm saying. Don't, don't, don't miss this. Don't miss the promise. Don't get so caught up in the glitz and the glamour that you miss Jesus. The second thing I want you to do, and we're going to do this as a church, and you can invite people, but I want to encourage those of you that are owners here at Living Water to do this with me. Let's do this together. They're going to put it up on the screen for me. Yeah, they already got it. I want you to download the YouVersion app on your phone. If you have a smartphone, which most everybody does in today's world, download the YouVersion app. It looks like a little Bible. It says Holy Bible, and if you don't have it, and you don't go, I don't know what that is, somebody will be at that next step desk. They're already back there. They'll help you download that, that uh, YouVersion of the Bible, and then go to the devotion plans. When you go to the devotional plans, download this one right here that is 21 gifts of Advent. 21 gifts of Advent. If you need to pay, take a picture of that, take a picture of it so that you'll know to do it later on. And I want you to download that. And as a church family, let's read this together and let's see the gifts of Advent that God has given us and how we can be a blessing in our community and how we can help others. So I want you to do that. And then I'm going to ask you to do something really, really, really crazy. This is the last thing for your next step. Are you ready? They're going to put it up on the screen for me. Here it is. I want you to tell someone about the promise each day between now and Christmas. Some of you just got really nervous, like you might have just peed just a little, all right? That's all right. This is what this looks like. A lot of you are going to go out to lunch today here in a few minutes. You're going to sit down at a restaurant. When you sit down at that restaurant, the people that are serving you are some of the greatest people in the world. I know they may not get your queso order exactly right, and the chips might be a little stale every once in a while, but somebody's serving you queso and chips, by the grace of God, amen. So, when you sit down for your meal, when you sit down and order your food wherever you eat at, um, look at your waiter or your waitress and say, thank you, this has got to be the craziest season of the year for you that are working. In just a minute, my family and I, we're going to pray before we eat, can we pray for you? Is there anything we can pray for you? Watch your waiter or waitress go, huh? And then pray over them. And then, I don't know who the person is at work that God may be putting on your heart that you need to tell somebody about Jesus. Listen, if you're nervous and you, got, you don't want to open up and tell all the story, invite him to come to church with you. We got three more weeks until Christmas. Oof, that's crazy. We got three more Sundays before Christmas. Invite him because we're just going to build on this, the anticipation of Christmas getting ready for it and ready for what Jesus has. Will you close your eyes for just a minute? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. We're going to pray together, and then Kyle's going to come out and close us out. I want to ask you this. See, God created you with a choice. God knew what you were going to choose. He already planned your life. He already knew how you were going to be, but you do get a choice in the matter. And there may be somebody sitting here this morning that says, I have never chosen to give my life to Jesus. But after hearing today, I need to choose to give my life to Jesus. Nobody has their eyes open. I'm the only one looking. If that is you this morning and you say, today I want to choose to give my life to Jesus, will you put your hand up real high? I'm just going to pray for you. I'm not going to call you down front. We're not going to embarrass you. Just put your hand up and say, there's some over there. Thank you. Any others? Put your hand up and just say, I need to give my life to Jesus today. Any others? Cool. Jesus, I pray for ones that raise their hands. God, I pray that today they make that choice. 
And they say, today, Jesus, I am giving you my life and I am following you. And then, God, I pray you take that and you build that in them. They tell someone of the decision that they made and they take the next steps of following you. God, we've all got these steps to take. So I pray for them. God, I pray for ones in our church this morning are thinking about Christmas and and there's a lot of hurt around Christmas and there's a lot of sorrow around Christmas and they're not anticipating. God, they're just hurting. I pray that they don't do life alone, that they talk to us and they let us walk with them as we go through this season. And then God, those that need to draw close to you, those that need to be challenged, let them take their next step today in following you, whatever that is. We're gonna trust you, we're gonna love you and we can't wait to see what you're gonna do next. It's in your name I pray. Amen.